Welcome. Good to see everybody. Uh, TV cameras, you guys, let me know when you're good. All right, we're just uh, wrapping up Clemson. Um, obviously a game that we didn't play well, and uh, I'll kind of share with you what I shared with the team, that you know, a result like that is, is never acceptable. Um, you know, and you, you go back and it's, it's so easy to say, well, geez, it was Clemson and, and they're this and they're that, and you go back and watch the film. And just the amount of times that we beat ourselves, uh, our inability to execute, and it started from the get-go. Um, you know, we allowed that first punt return that gave him a short field. Then we threw a pick that gave him a short field. Then we settled in there. And, uh, you know, we got the, uh, the recovery on the, the punt that they fumbled. And you got to score seven and not three, but it's 14-3, and it's 14-3, and we have the ball right before the half. And we throw a perfect slant to a wide open receiver who works a great release move, and we don't catch it. And that allows the next 14 points to happen. And instead of it being a 17-3 game at, high, at, at halftime, it's 31-3. Um, and even on those plays, uh, we had a safety that didn't have his eyes in the right place. We had a safety that lost leverage. And uh, Clemson, again, is as good of a team that we've played against in my time here. Uh, but so many of those things, you know, if you make those mistakes against anybody, you're going to get beat. And you make them against a team like Clemson, they're going to score touchdowns. So Clemson executed well. We didn't. Uh, a lot of the things we did are fixable, correctable, and that's why we practice. And so we get on the film on Sunday, we make the corrections, and whether you win a last second emotional game or whether you lose a game uh, like that on Saturday, you have to move forward. Um, and it becomes easy to move forward. We have a very, very important game uh, this Saturday night under the lights at, at BB&T Field. Uh, we play Duke for the hundredth time in the history of the series which is a big deal, a series that started back in 1889, and, and this is the 100th meeting of Duke and Wake Forest. Uh, it's an opportunity to be undefeated in the Big Four, which is really important to us. That was one of the excitement of the schedule this year is we had all three teams in the Big Four at home, and if we win this one, it would be only the eighth time in our history uh, and the first time since 07 uh, that we're 3-0 and against the Big Four. And it's also senior day. Um, this is, uh, has a chance to leave as one of either the, the most or the second most successful senior class um, in the history of, of Wake Forest football. And I think these guys deserve a, a send-off. Uh, we'd love to have a great home field advantage. And the senior class has done a lot for our program. These are all guys that came here uh, and either suffered through or committed to Wake Forest after a 3-9 and nine season. And now they're the first uh, senior class in the history of the school to be the four straight bowl games. Um, so uh, again, we hope we have a good crowd for a very important game. Uh, we still have a lot of our goals alive this year. Obviously one of them is off the table uh, after the Virginia Tech game, but a lot of them are still alive. And uh, it's a very important game for our team. And we play a good football team, uh, Duke. Is, is always one of the you know, best coached, fundamentally sound, disciplined football teams that we play um, on, on offense. Um, they're a talented team. The, the quarterback, Harris, can beat you with his arm or his legs. He's their second leading rusher. He's a tremendous athlete. Um, and he is certainly capable of playing at a very high level. Uh, at running back, it's really two guys, uh, Jackson, and Durant, those guys have combined for over 900 yards. Uh, Jackson's the primary ball carrier. Durant is second. Um, at tight end and receiver, they're big. You know, if you want, look at the depth chart, the amount of guys that are 6'4", 6'4", 6'2", um, they certainly present some matchup issues. And the O-line is a good mix of experienced guys and some young talent. The right tackle, Monk, is a kid that uh, we're really impressed with. Very athletic, watching him pull, pass set, and the other guys are very experienced uh, players. Uh, Duke overall is a very experienced football team. If you look at the two deep, um, they've got 26 juniors and seniors uh, in the two deep. And on defense, they start nine juniors and seniors. It's four seniors, five juniors, two sophomores. The two sophomores are both red shirts. And this is a very experienced unit. Um, they're six in the ACC in total defense. Um, and last week's score was very misleading. I mean, that was a, a tight 
one score game and then Duke threw a pick six and had two other turnovers that gave Syracuse a short field. So that became a very competitive one score 14 to six game to 35 to six because of the turnovers. And, and those are certainly things that hopefully we can generate but you can never count on. Um, this is three years in a row, this is the exact same matchup. It's a seven win team versus a six loss team. So you have a team that has a chance to have a really good season and a, and a special year um, against a team that's, that's fighting for their, their life. Because if they don't win it, uh, they're not going to a bowl. And, and two years ago, um, and I, I said this to our football team, I don't feel like the last two years the better team won this game. I think in 17, I think we were the better team. Duke came here five and six. They had to win to get to a bowl. And we turned it over twice. They hit a double move. They had a long punt return. Um, and they found a way to beat us on our home field. And then last year, we kind of flipped the script a little bit that we were five and six and had to win to go to a bowl. And, um, and they were pretty banged up at the time. And uh, we won a game that we had to get to continue our season. So. It's almost the exact same script as the past two years, the only difference being it's the second last game rather than the last game. Um, so we expect a tough, hard fought game. We need to get better. We got to do a better job coaching, a better job playing, a better job executing. Um, if we don't do those things, um, you know, it, it won't be a good night for us on Saturday because Duke is certainly a very capable football team. And all you have to do is watch their Virginia Tech game and other games that they had, and, and really they've lost two heartbreakers to Pitt and Carolina. You know, otherwise this could very easily be a, a seven-win team that we're facing. Dave, I know you, you like the chemistry and you like the, the maturity with youth of, this, of your team all year. Um, has there needed to be any kind of reminding or refocusing at what can still be accomplished with the Big Four sweep and getting a possible 10-win season and another bowl win? No, I think the challenge at this part of the year, Connor, is always, I mean, the, the season's long. And we've been going at this now for three and a half months. And you always have these younger players uh, that we're counting on, but this is the hardest thing they've ever done. I mean, they are holding on to that rope for dear life. And I'm sure part of them are saying, geez, how many more days do we got to do this? And and what we do here at Wake Forest isn't easy. We get up early in the morning. We have meetings that start early. And then the kids go to class all day. And then they go to study hall. And it's not easy. It's what they signed up for. But saying you're going to do it and then living it for the first time isn't easy. And then you have your older guys that this could be their last three football games of their life. And they are very, very aware of what's on the line. It's all the things you mentioned. Um, winning uh, the Big Four championship, um, getting to double-digit wins, going to a top bowl destination. They're very aware of what's in the moment. And the key to the end of these seasons is do the older guys in the leadership of your football team get the younger guys to play for them? You know, because the, the freshmen, you know, hey, everyone else other than the seniors, all they know is bowls. And, hey, we'll be in this position again. Well, you never know when you're going to be in this position again. It's hard to be in this position. You know, I don't know when we're going to have another chance to play all three of the big four teams in a season and win the first two. And, you know, it's, it's not easy to accomplish. So uh, our theme for the whole season has been sense of urgency. And I think as the season winds down that – there are certain goals you've accomplished, certain goals that are now out of reach, but a lot of other things to play for. Whatever teams can create that urgency and that sense of purpose are successful. Um, the 2018 Wake Forest football team created that sense of urgency when we were four and five. And whether the 2019 football team at seven and three creates that urgency, we'll see. You know, there's only so much as a coach that you can preach Either there's an internal buy-in and that self-motivation um, or the, you know, they succumb to human nature that, hey, it's tired, uh, we can't win the ACC anymore, we just got blown out by Clemson. Doesn't matter. Good football teams, good football players show up and have consistency to them. And that's certainly our challenge this week. Hey, Dave, you're, you already touched on this briefly, but you're 
your, your senior class, every one of them signed to you when your program will come out three and nine seasons. What can you say about what, what they've accomplished during their, their time here to kind of set the standard and even raise the standard during their four or five years here? I think that's exactly at last that uh, they came to Wake Forest when there were very low expectations for our program. Um, you know, we didn't have facilities. We had just come off of six or seven consecutive losing seasons. Um, and, you know, this group, when, when they first got here, it was a little bit of a divided locker room. I think there were some older guys that were, that quite frankly, didn't love football. We had some older guys that loved football. I mean, guys like Brandon Chubb and Mark Kelly and Jordan Garside and Ryan Javion and Cam. I mean, we had some really great kids and good football players in those classes, but there was a lot of those early groups uh, that didn't love football. They, they didn't like practice. They didn't like meetings. They didn't watch extra film. And so when this group got here, a lot of those players had to make that decision. Do I hang with this group that loves football or do I go with these guys that have other priorities that aren't going to help our football team? And this senior group that's walking on Saturday made that decision that football was going to be important to them. You know, Justin Stranad, Cade Carney, uh, I mean, all, you know, all those old linemen. I mean, it's, it's a great senior group. And nine of them a year ago could have graduated and transferred and played somewhere else, and they'd all be starting, I think, anywhere in the country. And they felt so invested in our program that all nine of them came back. And that's why we are in this position. So I, I love that group. I'm thankful for them. Um, and, and I hope they get a proper send off. It would be, um, you know, to not have a great crowd on Saturday for what this game means. Um, you know, we, we need our fan base to show up. We really do. We've got to have that stadium, our, especially our home stands, packed. And, and send these guys out the right way. And quite frankly, doing that helps generate future success. When you have a good crowd and recruits see it, it helps get the next recruit. And when you don't have it, it hurts. So, you know, we want to be in this position every year, but it's an ongoing process. And our, our fan base is very much a part of it. And, you know, we are very aware of the fact that in 18, we didn't play well at home. And I think this year we've corrected that so far with one exception. No, I just, Boogie's going to have a decision to make in December or January. And we really, we avoid those decisions and we avoid those meetings till the season's over because they're just distractions. Um, you know, there's certainly a chance that he may leave. And if he decides to leave, we want to make sure that we had a chance to, to honor him as a senior and be recognized for what he, he did. And, you know, we, last year we honored Kendall Hinton. And at that point, we didn't know if Kendall was going to come back or stay. And if he made a decision to leave and, and not come back, you know, we wanted to make sure that Kendall had his day with his family and he was recognized. How different do you think this is going to be for Kendall given last year to this year? You know, Kendall is kind of a, uh, he's not one of those roller coaster guys. And, and last year, as he went through this, it was very mature. and. He'll be very mature this year. I think if you asked him if he's glad he came back, I think he'd tell you he was. And what he has added to our football team, and you know, even as an example to our younger players, that you, know, you can make mistakes and recover from them if you refocus yourself and recommit yourself, and Kendall certainly has done that. Maybe also touched on this briefly. Uh, it's the 100th meeting between Wake Forest and Duke. You seem like you've got a, a deep a level of respect for that program. Does that respect, is it grounded in any way uh, because of the similarities between the two programs? It is. I mean, I, again, it's not like Coach Cutcliffe and I are, are close friends. I don't think the head coach at Wake and the head coach at Duke can ever be that close. But if you say, do I have great respect for what he's done there? Absolutely. I mean, he took a program that every year was winning one and two games and made them an annual bowl team. And I think we have similar challenges. Um, we both work at schools that the players just don't come there to play football. We both work at schools that the academics are challenging, that um, you've got to go to class, you have to do your own work. Um, it's academically grueling at both places. 
Um, you know, I, I think a, a newer challenge that we have now in college athletics um, is so many of these schools now, the players, all they do is take online courses. That they get up in the morning, they go to the football facility, they have meetings, they have practice, and they have all their meals in the football facility, they meet with all their tutors in the football facility, and they do all their classwork in the football facility because all their classes are online. Um, at Wake Forest, and I'm sure it's the same at Duke, our players go to class and they sit in the classroom and they interact with the professor. I love that about Wake Forest. I love the fact that you know, our players don't wake up in the morning and just spend 14 hours in a football facility. And, and I know that doesn't sound like a football coach, but that's buying in to what a student athlete should be and having a collegiate experience that's outside of football. And I think in some ways, probably Duke and us and schools like Northwestern and Stanford um, recruit similar kids. And I, I love coaching them, but you know, we have different admission standards and we have different academic standards. Um, and that's part of the challenge of this job that I embrace. And I, I think Coach Cutcliffe probably feels the same way about Duke. So um, again, is, is he a guy that you know, we meet halfway for dinner during the year? No. But I, I have great respect for what he's done at Duke and what he's accomplished. Um, and he's done a tremendous job there. And, and they're always well coached. And we're both at places that building depth is always a little bit of a challenge. And um, you know I, they've certainly had some depth issues in the last two years, uh, as have we. And I think that's a little bit of the nature of our programs. Dave, what's the challenge in evaluating how the offense has looked on Saturday to not maybe overreacting and overhauling things with two games left and, and given the, the opponent? Well, I mean, we didn't play well. We can't say that that was OK because it was Clemson. You know, I mean, there were things in the Clemson game that if we did against Elon or Rice would have got us beat. I mean, there, there's a play that it's a play action play and Waydell Jones is running untouched down the middle of the field unguarded but we didn't make the, long, the right communication call uh, on offense to block the safety. And so as a result, everyone sees on third down, hey, Wake's conservative and they're trying to hand the ball off and get sacked. And in reality, a play action pass was called that the receiver was wide open down the field that I could have thrown and caught that ball and scored a touchdown. So that had nothing to do with Clemson. The drops we had had nothing to do with Clemson. Now Clemson is a great football team and they certainly make executing hard. But there were things in that game, I don't care who we played, we didn't do correctly. And we have to own it as coaches and the player have to earn it. And you cannot say, well, geez, it was Clemson, we'll forget about it. Because if we do that, then we're never ever gonna get to that level or we can never send that message. We didn't play well. Um, we didn't play well in the perimeter. Uh, we didn't get open. When we got open, we dropped balls. I think the only two guys that had multiple catches were Kendall and Donovan. Um, we didn't run the ball well. We didn't block well. We didn't play well anywhere on offense. On defense, we had moments, but those two touchdowns we gave up before the half, again, those are plays that if we had done those things against Rice or Elon, we would have given up touchdowns. And then you do it against Clemson, and you're absolutely giving up a touchdown. So. I mean, as, as a program, we've got to look in the mirror and we've got to own it. And we can't say it's based on the opponent. We always have to say it's based on us. Dave, I've heard that Orlando Eggs has entered the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? It is correct. So again, with any of our student athletes, you know, we want what's best for them. And I think uh, for Orlando, um, you know, I can't speak for him, but uh, you know, to a lot of our players, the opportunity to play is, is really important. And if he can find a situation that gives him a better opportunity to play, um, and it's going to make his student athlete experience better, we certainly support that. Dave, there obviously wasn't a ton to smile about on Saturday, but it was pretty cool watching the celebration on the sideline after Keegan's interception. Can you talk about what that kind of meant to you and the team? And it, it seemed like he was a beloved figure by the way the reaction. He's, he's, Keegan's awesome. Uh, he has gone through two ACL uh, repairs and rehabs. Most players in that position would have quit and not played. And it's his last year here. 
and he's really helping our football team. And I think everybody in our program in that locker room sees how hard he works, uh, how much he cares, uh, what a great teammate he is. And when a player who is put into it, what Keegan has, on that stage makes that type of pick, everybody was thrilled for him. And we had a, a bunch of lowlights. We had a handful of highlights. That was definitely one of the highlights from Saturday. All right, hope to see everybody Saturday at BB&T. Go Deeks.